No one has ever changed the course of history like Jesus. A baby born in a stable, a homeless man who taught in the wilderness and healed in the streets. Praised by the common people, but hated by the religious authorities. Arrested, beaten, and crucified. This doesn't sound like the story of a man who could change the world. Hundreds of people had been crucified before him, and none of them changed the world. We don't even know their names, so what makes him different? He was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. He was Jesus. He was sinless. He was God. Death would not be the end of his story. Three days later, he would rise again, and his resurrection would give courage to the cowards, life to the lifeless, and hope to the hopeless. Jesus changed the world because Jesus is alive. Amen. Well, Jesus is alive, and that's what we're here for right now, to worship a risen Savior. And uh, we're starting a brand new series. As some of you have just seen by the video that played and the graphic that's up, uh, we are talking about Easter in perspective. Now, in Christmas time, we actually did this, and we talked about uh, Christmas in perspective and looked at various people um, throughout the Christmas story at how they would have basically viewed the birth of Christ. And so again, uh, we're doing the very same thing, taking a look this time at Easter in perspective and kind of focusing on characters of the Bible. I've specifically gone, of course, on Easter Sunday, it'll be all about Jesus, right? Um, but I'm going through the other three weeks about characters I feel that we can actually resonate with, that we can uh, relate with in some way. And so as we see the idea of perspective, we understand that to be how we see something. It's basically our point of view. That's what the word perspective means. So if I held a glass up here for you right now and I had it halfway, notice I said it that way on purpose, okay? You tell me real quick and you can shout it out. Is it half full or half empty? What do you think? And who said half empty? A couple of you said, okay, there it is, right? So she's a pessimistic one of the bunch. I'm kidding. Uh, but if you have the glass and it's halfway filled, it is either half full or half empty. Now, uh, it, really, it doesn't matter so much which way you say it. It's a matter of perspective. Somebody's been drinking it, so now it's half empty. Or somebody just filled it up and it's half full. It's all a matter of perspective. Truth is, the glass is still has halfway mark on it. Um, but you can think of it in, in different ways. You know, our perspective matters, right? How many of you watched the game last night between UNC and Duke? Anybody watch it? Anybody care? Okay. All right. UNC won, uh, and it was, a, it was a good game. It was tight. 18 or 19 lead changes. Uh, so it was actually a good Final Four game, whereas the other one that, that, that was played sort of was blown out the water 20 points in the first couple minutes almost. All right, but this game was interesting. Now, you can get down to that game. It's Coach K's potentially his last game, which I'm very proud of, the fact that UNC beat him in his last game. But anyway, that's my own personal perspective and opinion. But you could go ahead and you could say, you know what, defense was a problem there, especially in those last couple minutes. You know, Duke didn't, you know, D up well, or, or you could have that perspective. You could also throw a perspective out there that the refs made one bad call, that that shot that he made should have been counted, uh, and then he should have shot the free throw, but they called it on the ground. You know, you can have all kinds of perspectives of the way that you view this, and the bottom line is you can have a million perspectives when a million people are watching the game. We can all come from some different angle or some way of looking at it or just the way life hits us, whether we like a team or not, however that works. And the same thing is with the resurrection. We have to realize that everything we look at is fairly linear. It's written on a page. We look at that page and that's all we've got. But you know, there's so much in between the, the, the black lines or the black parts of the Bible. When you look at all the white that's on there, there's a ton of space of things that have not been written. Even John says that at the end of his gospel. If we could just record everything that Jesus did, these, no books in the world could contain it. All right? And so my point is just when coming to the resurrection, we have to realize different people saw it in different ways and it affected people completely differently. So we're going to start with one that you well know of as Doubting Thomas. 
All right, Doubting Thomas. He's going to be the guy we look at today. That's simply going to be the title of the message. Um, But I want to go in, and we're going to hit a text in just a few moments, but I want to go in just really dealing with who he was, okay? The Bible's actually not very clear. It doesn't say a whole lot on who Thomas actually is. He's a fairly ordinary guy. He's very normal, very simple. Would you say that about yourself? I would say that about me. You know, probably just normal, ordinary, you know, nothing spectacular. Um, it, Thomas did not have any kind of amazing conversion experience. He didn't have that. You know, we read about Peter and we read about James and, and you know, the fishing incident. We read about Nathaniel by the tree. We read about all these things that happen. And then guess what poor Philip gets? He gets a couple occurrences through all three of the major Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, All he gets is his name in a list. That's it. John's the only one who actually goes deep and says anything about Thomas. So we'll be going to John here in a few moments. Um, But I just want to make something clear. There are, in our estimation, no memorable accomplishments of Thomas except for one thing. And I started with his name. Doubting Thomas. If you don't know anything about Thomas, you at least probably know that. Or you've even been called a doubting Thomas, or you've heard somebody else say that about somebody else. You're just a doubting Thomas. You need to to have faith. You need to do better, whatever it is that they would say. This is what he's known as. He's known as the doubting Thomas. Poor guy. Uh, I'm hopefully today going to give you a completely different view of Thomas, okay? Completely different view. Because I want you to know he was so much more. I want you to know that God chose him. Chose 12. And he was one of them. Not only that, tradition teaches us that he ended up going to India after the fact. We don't see this in the pages of Scripture. And that eventually in India, he had led so many people to the Lord, created such a following that Hindu priests couldn't take it anymore and they killed him. All right? That's Thomas. Now that right there is faith, isn't it? That right there is example. That right there is follow me as I, as I follow Christ, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. That's the kind of perspective that he had. But I want to say to you that this world's perspective of you doesn't matter, okay? How people might define you, whether by a failure, whether by something that you didn't do correctly, whether by something that you said, this world's opinion of you doesn't matter as much as God's opinion of you. Because if you're a believer today, guess what? He also chose you. And He desires you to live for Him. So let's now enter in a text um, He was also involved in some ministry, and again, very little in the Synoptic Gospels, so we'll start in Matthew 10. But in Matthew 10, I'll just kind of read through this. It says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Theodos, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, uh, there are multiple beliefs about who Thomas was. His name means twin, and he's called that Didymus in another passage. And some people would suggest he's the twin brother of of Judas, not Iscariot. Um, Others actually, in tradition and written down, say he's actually a brother of Jesus. That one does not actually get a whole lot of credit. So I'm just throwing it out to you as information, okay? Um, But that's all that that is. But here he is, in this list, simply just mentioned. Here, by the way, there's a guy named Thomas. He's one of the twelve. All right, But look what he does. And, and we don't think about this often. He goes out, these twelve, verse 5, Jesus sent out instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Going back up to verse 1. He called Thomas. It doesn't say his name there, but it says the twelve. I want you to realize that Thomas has been called by Jesus. He has been called by Jesus. He's been given authority. That word authority is actually the Greek word simply for power. I kind of like the word better, power. Um, But it means also authority in various contexts. Um, He's been given power. He's been called by Jesus. And then he's been sent out. Hey, here's the deal. Are you and I any different? We've been called by Jesus. That's why we claim to be a believer of Him. We've been given authority and power. Behold, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll have authority. You know, you'll have power when He comes upon you. We do have that power, by the way. Uh, And then beyond that power, we have the ability to go out and the calling to be sent out. 
So in the very same way, we're almost a lot like Thomas so far. Things are really kind of lining up in a good way. But he was just, he was a common disciple. Everyone who bears the name Christian has these same things. To be called, to be given a power and authority, and to be sent out. But you know, you and I didn't get to live with Jesus for three and a half years like he did. You know, but we do get to learn about him from the experiences of others and from the pages of God's word. And we do have the command and the calling to share his story. Let me go on about, about Thomas. Thomas, as contrary to popular belief, was very courageous. And this is something, there's a verse that, that I even read in my studies here that I've never really given good attention to. And so I've always just called him Doubting Thomas. But I'm getting ready to show you something quite amazing about him. And so I want to start earlier. Um, it says in, in uh, John chapter 11, this dealing with Lazarus getting ill and he's going to die. But it says in verse 6, So when he, speaking of Jesus, learned that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Why did he stay those extra days? Because he knew he was going to die. And he knew that by the time they would get there, he would be four days dead, which means now the glory of God is going to be shown. Okay, um, But it goes on, and it says um, in verse 7, After this he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now I want you to catch this. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? You're going to take a trip to where they just tried to kill you, call you for blasphemy because he claimed to be the great I am. You're going to go there again because if you go there, you're likely going to end up joining Lazarus in the grave. And they go through this whole conversation. They begin talking about these things. Now skip down to verse 14 because it says here, then Jesus told them plainly. He said some things to them kind of in a parable fashion. And he said plainly, Lazarus has died. Meaning, by the way, that's omniscience because the word that just came back to him was that he was sick, right? So he already knows that he's dead. He already knows that he's waiting a little bit, and by the time he gets there, he'll be four days dead. But in verse 15, it says, And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. And he's getting ready to show him something amazing. He says, But let us go to him. Now, verse 15. But Thomas, John gives us something about him here. Thomas called the twin or Didymus in some translations, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second. Did y'all just, y'all reading what I'm reading here? Let us also go that we may die with him. I, I don't remember ever reading anything about Thomas and thinking anything, but he was a doubting Thomas, right? And here I'm looking at something right now. Man, what faith that he, that he displays at this time. There's a different view that Thomas has. Literally, he's willing to go on a suicide mission. Hey, the rest of you, the rest of you think that Jesus is going to go there and die. You know what? You might be right. Okay, fine. Whatever. Let's go. Let's take this trip. I'm willing to die. Jesus will either protect me or we'll die with him. We're going we're gonna to die with honor. We're going to do what's right in this situation. He was willing to go literally on a suicide mission. Now, of course, we know Jesus meant it for the glory of God. But at another level, I would say that Thomas was unknowingly right in the way that he was assessing this because this was Jesus' last trip to Judea. He would head that direction and you would read the rest of what we just spent the last four weeks discussing, those table conversations in the last week there in time, last evening of Jesus' life, uh, that is, before he laid down on the cross. Now, all the disciples would be willing to lay down their life for him. They all would say it verbally. We remember studying that and looking at that just a few weeks ago. But all would fail. And I want to just illustrate a few verses for you real quick. So we're in John 11. If you'll just look over real fast to John 16 and verse 32. We'll throw it up on the screen because I'm going to go through this kind of quick. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, the Father is with me. So they left him at that time. We then go on to Matthew, um, verse, um, or chapter that is 26, and going to be all the way down to verse 56. And it says this, But all this has taken place that the scriptures uh, might and the prophets might be fulfilled. Look at the last part. All the disciples left him and fled. That includes Thomas. That includes Peter. You know, that includes every last one of them. Lastly, just by way of referencing the verse, Mark 14 and verse 50, and they all left him and fled. 
So there proves it. Not one of the disciples stayed with them. John is credited to having gone to the, resur- or the uh, crucifixion, that is, with his mother, Mary. Um, but aside from that, every one of them left him. They all fled. In regards to Thomas, Westcott made this statement, he will die for the love which he has, but he will not affect the faith which he has not. In other words, what he's saying is he doesn't really understand what he's doing, but he's willing to lay down his life for it. And I think that's where Thomas was at that point. He unknowingly reflects the attitude of what it takes to follow Jesus. Now, you and I can knowingly reflect that attitude. We have it in Scripture. It's very clear. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. He was willing to do it, not even really understanding what was going to take place. You and I don't have the excuse of not understanding that. We must be like Thomas, but even more so now that we have this knowledge Uh, And this is a different view of Thomas. I think what this really shows is how much he loved Jesus. I think what this really shows is how much of a true disciple that Thomas wanted to be and that he desired to be. And so that phrase, doubting Thomas, is beginning, beginning to already fade. I don't know about you, but it's beginning to already fade in my mind just a little bit. So let's let's go on. John chapter 14, talking about um, we did this just a few weeks ago, Jesus saying that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But I want you to look at these verses again, verses 1 through 6. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I'm going you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now stop right there. Picture yourself as a disciple. You've just heard this message. He's speaking in parables, so it seems. And then he says, and by the way, you're going to know where I'm going. What are you thinking at that moment? If truly, if you're in that moment, you're there with Jesus, you and 11 others, you're thinking to yourself, you said I'm supposed to know where you're going? Is this the place we've been before? Is it the place we're going tonight? Is it the place we'll be at in the morning? Hey, real quick, I don't know. (laughs) Can you tell me where this place is going to be real quick? And lo and behold, who speaks up? Verse 5, Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know the way where, where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father except through me. Now, we've been told in various settings before not to question authority, not to ask certain things. I'm going to tell you the complete opposite, okay? If you hear me preach something or speak something and you say, I don't understand that or I don't think that's right, can I be the first one to tell you, approach me? I'd prefer if you wait till after the sermon. It's just kind of awkward if you, you know, speak up in the middle of the thing. But if you could wait till afterwards and seriously approach me about it. Because you know what? I could be wrong. Oh, go figure, right? And I can change and I can learn and I can grow and it'll impact and benefit me. But it might also just be a clarity issue and be something that actually benefits you. I've told you this before, but... When I was in college, um, I didn't know a thing. I, I, entered in, uh, I entered in and I heard these long words that were 13 and 16 and 17 letters long. And I mean, I knew that Jesus paid, paid the price for me. He died for me, rose from the grave. I, 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 I got that, okay? Matter of fact, I even knew more. I knew Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and I could even quote that one. Uh, I'm being sarcastic, but that was really the extent of me entering into Bible college. And I sit down and I'm in this Bible college and all of a sudden I hear the professor teach and I'm looking at words go up on, on the screen and on the board and in, in a paper in front of me and I've got to fill in blanks. And I'm like, how do you spell that? I don't even know what the heck that word is. Never heard it in my life before. But I'm thinking to myself, because while I'm thinking about all this and trying to learn this, I got kids next to me. They're kids now, I guess they're at that point, they weren't young adults. But young adults next to me at that point, they were, they were kind of questioning the professor and going at, back at the professor with some of these words. And I'm thinking, I am way out of place here. I don't know a thing about the Bible. But I certainly know one thing. I'm not going to ask a question and be the dumb one. Okay, I'm not going to look like an idiot here. I don't know what, what in the world. I have no idea what he's saying. But I will not ask in front of people. And so, lo and behold, what I would do is wait till after the professor was done teaching, and I'd wait till everybody had moved from all their theological rants and everything, and I would find a way to corner that professor where nobody could hear anything I was saying. And I'd say, I'd whisper, hey, can you tell me what you meant by that? And then I would say, because then you went over to this verse, and that doesn't make any sense. I just don't, I don't get how that connection is. You know, and then lo and behold, nine times out of ten, he'd show me, and say, oh, yeah, that's it. That makes perfect sense. And other times I'd actually challenge the professors and it would be kind of neat. You know, we'd have good, long conversation that happened as I continued. But I'm here to tell you this, 
Don't be ashamed to ask questions. Don't be like I was in that moment. Feel free to ask them. In your small groups as we're meeting from house to house and being able to, to live life with one another, ask your questions. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I've never understood why we say this. Just ask it. Because you're never going to get the answer if you don't. You're always waiting for somebody else to come up with it. What I like about Thomas here is he said just frankly, verse 5, verse five Lord, we don't know. It's not even of, hey, is it going to be? Or I think. It's just flat. We don't got a clue. I'm going to speak for everybody else right now. If they know, good for them. I don't. Where in the world are you going? Because I want to be there. Okay? Feel free to ask questions. Be real. You don't know everything. And neither do I. And so every day of your life, you should be learning more and more about the Word of God and more and more about how to grow closer to Him. And I challenge you to challenge what is taught. Challenge what's considered normal and get answers. For years and years, I sat in the Bible college realm, the masters and all this, and learned all kinds of things. To then teach for years and years the regurgitation of the things that I was told. And I considered myself a studier. I considered myself somebody who was studious in the Word of God. And later began studying stuff on my own, completely on my own, because I just thought, that doesn't seem to make sense anymore like it did years ago. And I have changed positions in my walk with the Lord of recent years and been excited. And it just it thrills my soul. But the only way you do that is to ask questions and to get Answer. So let's go on. Let's go on to the phrase doubting Thomas and where it comes from in John chapter 20. And uh, again, we're in the book of John because as we look at this, uh, John is the one who gives credence and credit to Thomas. Nobody else seems to do more than just put him in a list of disciples. And I actually want to read a little bit more here. So because we're actually looking at the resurrection, let's read about it, verses 1 through 10. It says in verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. While it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb, so she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. Would have loved to have been there to see that. And uh, reached the tomb first. Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. This looks a little different than like grave robbers. Because if this was grave robbers, you might have a piece of linen kind of laid around. Uh, You might have foot tracks, you know, footprints everywhere. But to have it folded and separated from the lint, that was weird, okay? So obviously, going through Peter's mind right now, I don't get what's going on. But it says, um, it wasn't lying with the linen cloths, folded up in a place by itself, verse 8. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the the disciples went back to their homes. Not firm answers, okay? They don't really know what's going on. They think they do, but they don't really exactly know. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And so as we go on, I'm not going to read all this on Mary. It deals with Mary Magdalene. Jesus comes to her. We're actually going to be in that text next week, talking about Mary. So I want to go there. Um, uh, But I want to go further than that. John 20, uh, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. But there's a verse I want to focus on here. It says this, that verse 20, When he said this, he showed him his hand and his side. Notice that. Notice that none of the other ten, this is aside from Judas Iscariot, who had by that point uh, killed himself. This is showing that these other, these other ten that were there at that time, except for Thomas, because he wasn't there, Jesus willingly went to them and said, hey, there's my hands, just in case you guys are wondering about this. By the way, right there, that's my side. That's where he pierced me at the end. Y'all remember, did, did you see that? You know, of course, John was there. He would have validated that's exactly what happened. This is who it is. But what I'm pointing out is, 
it doesn't record any of the others saying, I don't believe. It doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus didn't even give him the opportunity. He said, hey, this is my hands and my side. Okay, Thomas wasn't there. So you can imagine the conversation when Thomas comes back to the disciples and they're saying that he has risen from the dead. And Thomas is saying, I want to see his hands. I want to see his side. That was cool. You know, I want to be able to say, yes, without a shadow of a doubt, I know that that's Jesus. I want to be able to say the same thing. So Thomas, verse 24, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. What else did they see? We've seen his hands. This is not in the text, but it's in the text, okay? This is what they probably said. He showed us his hands. He showed us his side. We saw the whole thing. This, in fact, was Jesus, was the guy we've been with for so long. He is our master. He was here. We saw it. And he, and he says to him, Unless I see the, his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I'm here to tell you right now, based on the other things I've read about Thomas so far, I don't think he was saying that he doesn't believe Jesus could rise from the dead. I think he was saying, I want to experience what you guys have experienced. I want to see that. And you know what? I want to put my hands right there. I want to see the whole. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that this is who it was. Eight days later, verse 26. Eight days later. <laughs> okay, you got to picture that. Over a week, his disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them, and although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, before Thomas had a word to say anything, again, his omniscience here, showing that he is God, put your finger here and see my hands. Put, your hand, put out your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I think here, that Thomas wanted to experience Jesus the way the others experienced Jesus. I think he wanted to know Jesus on that kind of a level. All right, The resurrected Savior, now I have seen Him with my own eyes. Now I have actually seen these prints in His hand and in His side. You know, and so when I think about that, I think, don't you and I want to know Jesus on that kind of level? Or know Him at a greater level? Or know him like, and you can name somebody else. Somebody that you might look up to. Somebody, this podcast that you listen to that you think that, that they are gr gr helping you grow spiritually. Don't you want to know Jesus like that person? Maybe even better. Don't you want to know Jesus better than Paul? Don't you want to know Jesus like these guys? And you know, it's that kind of attitude that I see with Thomas. Not the attitude of, oh, I, I just don't believe. <laughs> and that's it. I don't see that. That's not what the text seems to say. We don't need a physical manifestation. But Jesus knew that Thomas did. And Jesus meets us exactly where we are. When we look at the resurrection, the resurrection means all kinds of things to all kinds of people. I think about myself and I think about my failures and my own personal shortcomings and I think about what I need in my life. And you know what the resurrection does? It gives me all that. Because He forgives me of all of my sins and washes me clean. But you and I are so different. We all have different sins. We all have different failures. We all have different things in our lives that we need to overcome, that we need to, His help with. And He meets us exactly where we are. Thomas needed this. That's what he needed. And Jesus met him in that need. And He said in this, in verse uh, 27 at the end, He said, Do not disbelieve, but believe. In essence, He's saying, Stop being an unbeliever but show yourself a believer. Okay? Don't live in unbelief. Believe. That's what you have to do. Just what you and I have to do. We need to be able to believe that He is the Messiah, that He did come and He did die, but that He also rose from the dead. And what I find here is amazing. Thomas did not say, okay, let me see it. Here, come on, show it to me. Yeah, okay, that one looks like it. I see that one. Let me, other hand, other hand. You know, that was not the case. That's not what Thomas did. In fact, he says this, my Lord and my God. The Greek is super simple. In English, it actually means my Lord and my God. Okay, it is very, very straightforward, very simple, but it means so much. My Lord, my Master, the one whom I follow, and without a shadow of a doubt, God Almighty Himself. 
It's right there in front of me. I don't need your hands. I don't need the side. I don't need to see the feet. All I need is you. Thomas got it, and he saw it, and his claim was to Jesus' lordship and was to his deity, all in one quick sentence, my Lord and my God. Wow, that's who he is. The belief was instantaneous, but it was more than that. You know, I want you to know, church, that you guys can believe in God, you can believe in Jesus, but do you realize the demons do the same thing? And they shudder. Okay, there's, there's more to this. There's more to simply attending a church service, being faithful within our small group. There's more than teaching a lesson, more than working in a ministry or leading a group. Have you seen Jesus for who He is? Can you cry out the same type of thing that Thomas said? My Lord my God. Because if you can't truly say that about Jesus, then you have to ask yourself the question, is He your Lord and is He your God? And if He's not, what in the world is in His place that needs to be taken out of place? Because Jesus deserves first place. Thomas saw the resurrected Christ and his life was forever changed. Listen, truth is, Doubts are going to come and go. It's not a sin to have doubts, okay? You and I will have things that we doubt, things that we don't understand, questions that we're going to have in life. But here, this was about making sense of everything that he had seen and been taught. And he went after it. He wanted to know, Jesus, tell me where you're going to be so I can be there. Later, hey, I want to actually see him like you guys have seen him because I want to know this Jesus in this way and I don't know him in the same way that you guys do. That was Thomas's attitude. So frankly, I kind of think the phrase doubting Thomas has way too much of a bad connotation for this poor man. All right? But I'm not going to change it in one sermon. He's going to forever be known, I'm sure, as doubting Thomas. Listen, here, this is what faith looks like. Right here. And I want you guys to see this because this is the kind of faith that you and I need to have. In 1 Peter chapter 1, last passage I just want to go to, I think he says this really, really well. And he says, Blessed be the God, verse 3, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That's faith. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Easter in perspective, guys. The resurrection in perspective here. He says in verse 4, To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Uh, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, this is what I want you to get. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now I want to stop right there because it says, You've not seen him, but you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Take you back real fast to John 20 where we just were. And Jesus' statement down to him was this. After he says, My Lord and my God, have you believed because you've seen me? I don't think this was a reprimand at all. I think it was for you and I to read today. April 3rd, 2022. Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Guys, we don't have the, the ability right now to see the resurrected Christ. One day we're going to. And it's going to be a beautiful day and an amazing time to be able to connect with our God, my Lord and my God. But what we do right now is we have faith, believing that He came with a purpose to lay down His life a ransom for many, for all, and that He would rise from the dead, showing that He has power over death, sin, and hell, and everything. And guys, we have victory through Jesus Christ. He paid the price for us. Our faith has to be in my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for being such an awesome God, and we love you for it. And we just thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you because you're so deserving of it. 
God, we ask that you would bless the remainder of our time together. We thank you that we've been able to dive into your word. We pray, Lord, that it would impact us and help us all for your glory. And we give you all the credit for it. Lord, as Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, and he was courageous and he showed forth his faith and his love for you and just wanted to know you in a way like or even more than anybody else. That's the kind of guy he was. But it was all because of what you did for him. You died and you rose again. And so, Lord, the power of the resurrection still lives on today and applies to our lives, and we thank you for it. We pray now that we'd worship you in spirit and truth, and we'd give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.